Now the 2-0 delivery. May send another one. Tell it bye-bye, baby. Aaron doesn't even move. It's going far up into the center field of places. Willie Mays. Uh, here's the pitch. A line drive to center. This could be it. Mays waiting. He's But as you know, it always comes a time for someone to get out. And I look at the kids over here, the way they are playing, and the way they are fighting for themselves, tells me one thing. Willie, say goodbye to America. Thank you very much. Yeah, the, the late, great Willie Mays, who died earlier this month at age 93. You know, and Willie Mays is a great baseball player. By many accounts, most people say he's the greatest baseball player that ever lived. And I think about Willie Mays' life, and I think about what made him so great. I think there's countless reasons, but I think in particular, he served with excellence and humility both on and off the field. I think many people don't know that Willie Mays actually served humbly in the U.S. Army. He was drafted in 1951, and he served until 1953. In fact, where he learned his famous basket catch, it came in the Army. The Army taught him that. Not the Navy, the Army. (laughs) I served proudly in the Army, by the way, if you didn't know that. But also, Willie Mays humbly served his community. I was watching a documentary earlier this week, and there's these beautiful pictures of Willie Mays. He's out in the neighborhood. Willie, when he was playing for the New York Giants, he lived in Harlem. And he would go out in the mornings, in the days, and he would spend his morning playing stickball with the neighborhood kids. And it was this beautiful picture. And what I saw was the joy of the kids as they would throw the ball. He would whack it down the street. They would run after it, and they'd bring it back to him. Then somebody else would pitch it. He'd do the same. But it wasn't just the joy on the kids' faces, the joy on Willie's face was so beautiful. And I also think about how Willie humbly served his bride, May Louise. He was married for over 40 years to May Louise. In particular, he personally cared for her the last 16 years of her life as she battled the effects of Alzheimer's disease. And so we think about Willie Mays. In fact, his manager, Leo DeRocher, once said this famous quote, you may have heard it, nice guys finish, last. But with Willie Mays, Leo DeRocher got it all wrong. A humble servant to society. And so today, I just want to welcome you to week three. Welcome you to week three of You're Up, answering God's call to serve, answering God's call to sacrifice, answering God's call to follow, answering God's call to share, and answering God's call to worship. And that phrase, answering God's call, simply means this. It's responding to God's invitation and then obediently walking and following him. It's living out a life in obedience. That's answering God's call. And today we're looking at this idea of answering God's call to serve. Now that word serve has many different definitions, doesn't it? One of those definitions is probably the most popular, is perform duties or services for another person or an organization. And so someone also would say serve is to present food or drink. That's also serve. And we also know there's many different meanings to serve. Let me give you an example. So in tennis and volleyball and other racket sports, if you serve up an ace, that's a good thing. But in baseball, if you're the pitcher and you serve up a pitch, guess what happens? that pitch is still flying over the fence because you just served up a meatball sandwich to the batter. That's not a good thing. And so service has many different meanings, and also we know that it has countless definitions. But what's really important to us, church, is this. What does Jesus say about service? What does Jesus say? And so as we've done each week and will continue to do in the coming weeks, we're going to go over here to the dugout, We're going to go back 2,000 years, and we're going to look, and we're going to listen, and we're going to actually learn from Jesus. And so what I want to do today is I want to take you to a passage that's in the Gospel of Mark, verses 42 and 45. And as you're turning there, I want to just give you a kind of set the stage for you. What's going on? Well, Jesus finds himself in the middle of a quarrel. 
And what's this quarrel about? Well, the quarrel's about this. James and John, two of Jesus' closest disciples, have just gone to Jesus, and they said this to Jesus. Jesus, when you're in your glory in heaven, which one of us will get to sit on your right, and which one of us will get to sit on your left? See, they were looking for the power, the prestige, the honor of where they were going to sit. Well, guess what happened? The other 10 disciples found out about it. And the Bible says here, they were indignant. And so Jesus steps into the middle of this. And what is Jesus going to say to calm the storm, to squash the squabble amongst his disciples? Listen to these words beginning in verse 42. Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man, I want to hit the pause button there. Son of Man is Jesus' favorite term that he references of himself. So Jesus says, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And so as we think about those words of Jesus, what do we see? What do we hear? What do we learn from Jesus? And so I think the first thing we do is this. He calls us to reorient how we look at ourselves and how we lead others. Jesus calls us, calls us to shift our way of thinking. He's reminding his disciples. Remember what the squabble was about. It was about position and honor and power and authority. And Jesus said, oh, you got to reorient your thinking. And so I think about those words when Jesus talks about it. He says, the rulers of the Gentiles and those high officials... Jesus is talking about those people who are non-Jews who are in positions of authority, the Romans and the Greeks in particular. And in that particular era of the world, the Romans were the ones in power. And the Romans and Greeks believed this, that they were born to lead. They were born to rule, not to serve. And that's what they believed. And they believed as leaders that the people served them. The people existed to serve them. But what does Jesus say about this? Jesus says, oh, not so with you. If you're my follower, you're a servant leader. I've called you to serve people, not to be served by people. And Jesus uses these two words. And Jesus says, first of all, he says, to be great in the kingdom, you must be a servant. And that word in Greek is actually diakonos. And we're going to put that up on the screen for you. Diakonos is simply this. One who executes the commands of another as a servant, attendant, or minister. And that word deacon, when you hear that word deacon, it literally means somebody who ministers within the church. That's where that word comes from. But Jesus also uses the phrase, to be first in the kingdom, you must be a slave to all. Now I want to just pause right there, because when we hear that word slave, it just causes us to recoil. Because I think for each and every one of us, we know the effects and the scourge of slavery. We've seen it in our own country. We've seen it in the world. And we still see it today in the form of child trafficking and human trafficking. But that word that Jesus references here is Greek. It's doulos. And that simply means this, one devoted to another to the disregard of one's own interests. And so Jesus uses those two words. You've got to be a diakonos and you've got to be a doulos. Sounds like a law firm, doesn't it? The law firm of diakonos and doulos. It's just beautiful words to remind us that that's who we're called to be. And what's interesting is those words are very similar, but they're different. And here's the nuance. Doulos is simply emphasizes who you belong to, while diakonos emphasizes the work you do. And so if you're a follower of Jesus, you belong to Jesus. And if you are a follower of Jesus, you serve for Jesus. So we're called to be both. Because we follow Jesus, we are both a servant and a slave. We understand our call is to serve Jesus. And when we serve, we're not serving ourselves. We're serving what? 
We're serving for Jesus. We're serving for Jesus. And Jesus also, I think, calls us to this, rethink our expectations to be served. And instead, what does he tell the disciples? And he tells us today, serve humbly and serve humbly. And so if you've been reading through the Gospels, I know that many of you have joined us on this journey of reading through one of the four different Gospels over the 30-day period. But when you read the Gospels, it should strike each and every one of us of how Jesus served so humbly. I mean, whether it was caring for people or feeding people or helping people who were sick and meet their needs, Jesus did it all, and he did it all with humility. In fact, I was reminded this week as I was reading in John 13 of Jesus demonstrates one of the greatest acts of humble service as he what? Washed his disciples' feet. He washed the disciples' feet. And that, Jesus was demonstrating that nothing is beneath him. Therefore, nothing should be beneath us when it comes to serving. Because the role of somebody to wash feet in that particular culture was reserved for the lowest position in the socioeconomic scale. But yet Jesus washed his disciples' feet, one who would betray him, one who would deny him, and all of whom would abandon him. And yet Jesus did what? He humbly served them. And so as we think about these words from Jesus, we're reminded that our world, the world tells us to serve ourselves. But what does Jesus do? Jesus calls his followers to serve others with humility, intentionality, and gratitude. Intentionality, gratitude, and humility. And so if we want to follow Jesus, we have to remember, we belong to Jesus, and therefore we serve for Jesus. And that's what it means to be a follower of Jesus And we are called to live that out. And so as we think about how then can we live this out? How can we step up to the plate and live this out in our own lives? Well, one of the most beautiful verses in Scripture that reminds us of the importance of serving humbly comes in Galatians 5.13. The Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, writes these words to the church Because at that time, what was going on, there were people in the church who were using their freedom not to serve others, but to serve themselves and do whatever they wanted. And so listen to what the Apostle Paul says to the church back then, which we also can apply to our lives today, amen? He says this, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another, how? humbly in love. Serve one another humbly in love. And I love that picture of serving humbly, but serving in love. And so as I think about our lives, we can live it out really kind of three practical ways from this verse. Number one is this. We remember what Jesus rescued us from and set us free to do. Jesus, what did he rescue us from? He rescued us from the grip of sin and death and the enemy, And then he set us free, not to live for ourselves, but what? To live for him. And how we live for him, one way we live for him is we serve him and we serve for him. We remember what he did and we serve others. And so thinking about that idea of how do I serve others, it allows me both to experience God's love, but also then to express God's love. And many of you experienced that this morning when you came on campus or you joined us online and you have experienced God's love as other people have been using their gifts to express his love. Whether it was a greeter or someone in the parking lot or one of our worship team members, they were experiencing God's love and expressing God's love so that you could experience God's love and eventually you could express God's love. It's this beautiful picture of serving humbly in love. And so how how else can we live it out as we reflect on these words from the Apostle Paul? Number two, we reject the desires of our flesh and the demands of the world to serve ourselves and our selfish desires. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're reminded on a daily basis that there is this conflict. And the conflict is my own selfish desires, my self-centeredness, my self-wants, and also the influence of the world that says what? 
serve yourself first. And so we have this natural battle. Every one of us has a battle, the flesh. Serve me, serve me, serve me. The world says, serve yourself, serve yourself, serve yourself. But what does Jesus say? Oh, serve me. And as you serve me, you serve others. It's a beautiful reminder for us. And we have to understand that. And I think for me in particular, how I've overcome or tried to really work through that on a daily basis is I have a daily prayer that I started praying several years ago. And it's very simple. It's this. Jesus, how can I serve you today? Jesus, how can I serve you today? It's not how can I serve my family? How can I serve my church? How can I serve this country? How can I serve my neighborhood, my neighbors? Jesus, how can I serve you today? And some days the Lord gives me just something very simple like call your dad. Talk to your dad about Jesus. Some days it's just, hey, text your brother. And some days it's, hey, remember that conversation you're going to have with somebody on the staff at Shoreline? Do it with grace. Just serve. But then every now and then the Lord gives me something that's life-changing, that's truly revolutionary. So a few years ago, in fact, several years ago now, I'd just gotten back from a 15-month deployment to Afghanistan. And I got back, and I said that prayer one day. And when you say that prayer, you better be ready not to reject what God puts on your heart, but you better be able to respond. And so I said that prayer, Jesus, how can I serve you today? And the Lord put on my heart, serve your bride. Serve your bride. And this is what Jesus put on my heart. Number one, Serve your bride by taking over the finances. You see, my wife was actually a full-time college student. She waited for 26 years to go back to school to get her degree. And she was a full-time student and managing the household while I was deployed to Afghanistan. And for the previous 20-plus years in our marriage, she carried the burden of doing our finances and balancing the checkbook because I was always training somewhere, deployed somewhere, so she did that. But the Lord put on my heart, you're going to take that burden off of her shoulders and you're going to serve her by doing that. And do you know what the other revolutionary, life-changing thing that the Lord put on my heart that I needed to serve her and what I needed to do? The laundry. The laundry. That was one way that I could bless my wife. I could serve my wife was doing the laundry. And so guess what I did? I actually started doing the laundry. If you ask my wife today, honey, who still does the laundry? There you go. So every Friday, she comes home from work. She's a teacher. She's an elementary teacher. She comes home, and there on the bed are her clothes, folded, dress right dress, neatly on, the t- on her bed. And I have found such great joy in that. There's something about doing laundry. It's like bringing, you know, out of chaos, you bring order. But simply asking that prayer and saying that prayer, remind myself that, oh, I serve you, Jesus. So when I'm folding that laundry and I'm doing the bills, I'm not doing it for me. I'm not doing it for my bride. I'm doing it for Jesus. And that's the joy that each one of us can experience as we think about that. And the third way we can live this out is this. We recognize the needs of others and the church and respond in love by serving others humbly. And so how are we called to serve? In love with humility. And I think about somebody in my life who demonstrated this, this idea of how you serve tells others who you serve. Let me say that again. How you serve, how I serve, tells others who we serve. And there's a man in my life, his name is Colonel S. Dan Johnston. As a young soldier, my fellow soldiers and non-commissioned officers, we called him Big Red. And you can see by the picture that we'll have up on the screen here, he was called Big Red because of his hair, but also because he was a leader who demonstrated tough love for his soldiers. And sometimes his face would get really red when he got really intense. And so he was called, we called him Big Red. But what I love about Colonel Johnson was he was a follower of Jesus first. And he served his family. He served his community. He served our nation And he served in so many other ways that people don't even know about it. 
And one of the ways he served, he served with great humility. I remember many times as a non-commissioned officer, when I was the physical training officer and I would stand in front of the company, sometimes in front of the whole battalion, all the troops lined up in front of me and I would be the one leading physical training that day. And so I would say, extend to the left and they'd all go this way. And then I'd say, the first exercise is the side straddle hop. And then we go through the side straddle, jumping jacks. And we do that and we go through that. And as we're doing the exercise, I'm looking out in the middle of the formation, and lo and behold, there's Big Red. There's Colonel Johnston. See, he didn't come up to front and say, I'm in charge. I'm going to take over now. He was out there with the troops, serving humbly, doing the training together with the troops. And one of the great joys that I have in my life is one day I was called to the battalion commander's office. Now, that's normally not a good thing, is it? He said, Sergeant Stroud, you need to report to the battalion commander's office. And so I went into the office, and I stood before Colonel Johnston, and I saluted, and I said, sir, Sergeant Stroud reports for duty. He said, Sergeant Stroud, stand at ease. So I stood at ease. And he then proceeded to tell me, Sean, I see great potential in you. And I know that you want to make a career out of the Army. I think you've got what it takes to become an officer. And he said, I have a scholarship application I can give two waivers, and I would love to give you one of those waivers so that you can get out of the Army, go back to school, and become an Army officer. And so here's what I want you to do. I want you to take this packet home with Amy, your wife, and you sit down and you pray about it. Now, I want to share something with you. It's really important. I was not a Christian yet. I wasn't a Christian. But Colonel Johnston knew that what I really needed was Jesus. And that some way, shape, or form, as he humbly served me, he was pointing me to Jesus. And five years after that encounter, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. I want you to know how we serve tells people who we serve. Amen? And so as we think about that, this idea of serving humbly, how then can we leave a legacy? So we come over here. Let's move over into the coaches circle. For every one of us, we're called not just to take these lessons and apply only to our lives, but how do we live it out and how do we pass it on? How do we leave a legacy for others? And we're reminded that everyone will leave a legacy of some sort. The question is, what will your legacy be? What will your legacy be? And I'm reminded of this idea of serving humbly and the importance of it. I'm reminded of this from 1 Peter 4, verses 10 and 11. Now, I want to remind you as well that Peter, one of Jesus' closest disciples, was there at the squabble. And so decades later, I want you to listen to these words. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, Peter writes to the church decades after the incident, the squabble, the quarrel over serving and the importance of serving, not ourselves, but serving humbly. It says this, each of you should use whatever gift you've received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides so that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. And so what's important is, gee, Peter says, it's each of you. Peter doesn't say some of you use your gifts. He said each of you. And also he says, use your gift to serve. Use the gifts that God's given you to serve. Not serve yourself, but to serve others. And why do we serve? Right there in those words so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. So as we use our gifts, as we serve others humbly, God will be praised. To him be the glory and honor and power forever and ever and ever. Amen. And so thinking about this idea of sharing and passing on, what can we share with others? What can we pass on as we serve others? Number one is this. It's share the gifts of the Spirit to serve others and build the church. Share the gifts of the Spirit to build the church. And I want to just, if you're a follower of Jesus, just a great reminder for each and every one of us 
that if you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, which means you've came to the cross, you confessed your sins, and you said, Jesus, I love you, I will follow you, you are the Lord of my life, I wanna follow you the rest of the days of my life. You're a follower of Jesus Christ. At that moment, God himself comes and indwells or takes up residence in us through the presence of the Holy Spirit. And it's a permanent residence. And not only that, but when the Holy Spirit comes, the Holy Spirit doesn't come with empty hands. The Holy Spirit comes with gifts. Gifts that he gives each and every follower of Jesus Christ. And those are called spiritual gifts. And we're reminded that these spiritual gifts are not for our glory, therefore his glory and for the good of others. And so I think about using our gifts to build the church. I think about two people in my life that are very important to me. I want to introduce you to Tony and Lorraine Throdall. And here's a picture of their family from around 1964. Now, does that look like a busy family to you? Well, this family, actually, this is just five of their seven children. But this is Tony and this is Lorraine Throdall. Now, what I want to share is that they, are both, they were both followers of Jesus, but they were so uniquely different when it came to gifting. You see, Tony served as an executive for the Green Giant Company in Lesur, Minnesota, where their family lived. And Tony was gifted in the gifts, spiritual gifts of administration, leadership, and teaching. And he faithfully used those gifts, gifts in multiple ways. Specifically, he was an elder in the church, and he led a team of four families as they planted a new church in Lesur, Minnesota. And Tony would use his gifts of leadership as an elder, but also teaching. He loved to teach Bible studies. His favorite Bible study was the book of Romans. And he would teach that faithfully every year, every Sunday, Tony's class. And Tony would be leading and teaching. Lorraine, on the other hand, she was gifted in care and service and compassion. And any given Sunday, you know where Lorraine would be? She would be in the nursery, rocking babies, caring for toddlers, That's how she used her gift. Now, the beauty of this story is that they were both faithful and fruitful as they used their gifts. Because as you think about their own family, their own family, in time, each one of their own children came to know Jesus Christ. In fact, that little baby girl, that precious baby girl on her mother's lap is my precious wife of 40 plus years. And I think about the legacy that Tony and Lorraine left that little church that they planted in Lesur, soon it outgrew its capacity. They had to build a new church, and that church grew bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually, and even today now, they have another church. They have two churches that they've planted, that family, out of that one church. Now, Tony and Lorraine have gone, they're with Jesus now. And their legacy that they left is not on the ball field. The legacy that they left It's in the roads of heaven. It's in the streets of gold of heaven. And if you're a follower of Jesus, one day you'll meet them. They faithfully used their gifts. And so we think about each one of us. What are our spiritual gifts? And for some of you, you know what that is, but some of you don't. So today, I want to encourage you. We are offering a spiritual gifts class right after this service and also after our 11 o'clock service as well. And we want to encourage you to think about going up there and finding out what your spiritual gifts are. And that'll be up in the garden room after service today. But also, if you're watching online, we have an online spiritual gifts class as well. Because what that class will help you discern and determine is your spiritual gifts and how you can find great joy in using those gifts, like Tony and Lorraine, and the impact, the difference that you can make for the kingdom eternally. And also the second question is this, thinking about your gifts, how are you using your gifts to serve Jesus today? How are you using those gifts to serve Jesus and his church? Now, when some of you came on campus this morning, you looked out in the courtyard and you're like, what is going on out here? What's up with this celebration? Well, what it is is our team is celebrating the opportunities that you have to serve Jesus And they actually have gone out there and they've set up and they would like to invite you. This is an invitation to discover your spiritual gifts and to go and use those spiritual gifts to serve here at the body of Shoreline. And there's so many different ways you can do that, but I want to 
remind you of what Pastor Keith said earlier, and I love that. Keith talked about giving is an opportunity. It's not an obligation. Serving, it's an opportunity, not an obligation. It's an opportunity for the glory of Jesus, for you to discover your gifts and to use those gifts for his glory and others' good. Amen? And that's the, the beauty of that. But also, what else can we pass on? What else can we share? We can share the love of Jesus to serve children, students, and the next generation. I was reminded as you read that passage of Mark 10, verses 42 and 45, earlier in Mark chapter 10, there's another time when someone's indignant. And do you know who's indignant this time? It's Jesus. And why is Jesus indignant? Because the disciples were trying to prevent children to get to Jesus. And Jesus was like, oh, no, let the little ones come to me. And what did Jesus do? He embraced them. He blessed them. He loved them. And we, as a church, we have the opportunity to do that for Shoreline's children, to love them in the name of Jesus. And so I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to think about how you might use your gifts to love on and to share the love of Jesus with our children. And there's a special invitation for each and every one of you. Stop by our children's ministry area. Pastor Greg is going to share with you an opportunity that he calls Summer Squad, that there's a short-term serving opportunity where if you've got some time this summer that you could step in and help Pastor Greg and our children's ministry team, that would be a huge blessing for us. So I want to encourage you, when you leave today, to swing by there and talk with Pastor Greg. If you feel the Lord nudging your heart and you feel, I would like to serve children, I would like to serve our students, I would like to serve our next generation, that might be the opportunity for you to use your gifts as well. And then finally, we can share the grace, mercy, and compassion of the Father to serve others in need or at risk. And we all know people like that in our life, don't we? people who are in need, people who are at risk. And we have an opportunity to show compassion and care like Jesus does and like Jesus did for his disciples and as he demonstrated for us as we walk through the Gospels. And one of the ways you can do that is simply you can volunteer at our food pantry. You can volunteer to go to care centers and minister to the people there. And you can even volunteer to be part of our prayer teams who so faithfully every Sunday come up here in front or they're gathered somewhere else praying for our church and for the needs of our church. And I know that for many of you, you're at home right now and you're watching online and you're saying, Pastor Sean, I would love to come and serve at the church, but right now my health, something in my life, I can't do that. So I want to invite you to think about one unique way that you can serve our church. You can serve our pastors, our staff, you can serve the body, and that is to be a prayer warrior. You can pray no matter where you're at and what you're walking through. And we'd like to invite you to be part of that. We'll give you an invitation for that and an opportunity to connect with our team at the end of the service as well. So the question then for each one of us, I go back to that simple daily prayer. How can I serve you, Jesus? How can I serve you, Jesus? How can I say yes to Jesus? And how can I say yes for Jesus? as I think about the importance of serving. How can I serve my family with greater intentionality? How can I serve my neighbors with greater joy? And how can I serve the church, this church, Shoreline Church? And if you're visiting today and you're a member of a local church, how can you serve your local church? Each one of us to think about that. And so as we go into our closing time of prayer, I just want to invite you to just open your hearts. Go ahead and bow your heads. And I want to share those lyrics that Kaya led in that song earlier, that song, Send Me. And just let these words fill your heart and your mind. If it's bandaging the broken or washing filthy feet, here I am, Lord, send me. If I'm poor or if I'm wealthy, I'll serve you just the same. Here I am, Lord. Send me. And that last chorus, when I'm standing in your glory, I'll be glad I chose to say, here I am, Lord. 
send me. Well done, good and faithful. I live to hear you say, here I am, Lord, send me. And so Jesus, that's our prayer this morning. That wherever you call us to serve, however you call us to serve, Jesus, as your followers, that our heart's desire is that we would answer your call with gratitude and with intentionality and with humility. And Jesus, we're reminded that you were the one that called us and that you set us free to live freely for you. And so Jesus, as only you can do through the work of your Holy Spirit, would you speak to us? Would you show us areas in our life where we can serve with greater joy, with greater gratitude, and with greater intentionality? And so Jesus, we give you this And we commit this, believing in faith that you will do great things in and through us as we follow you all the days of our life. And we pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, as I mentioned, the opportunities for you to serve are out in the courtyard. I want to encourage you, if you're gathered here on campus, when you walk out from here, please walk out into the courtyard and just walk around and get to know some of our ministry leaders, but also check out the serving opportunities that are available there as well. And for those of you who are online, you can actually connect. You can visit our serving page. Earlier this morning, there was an email that was sent out. You can click on the link there and you can go to our serving page and see what opportunities are available for you. And also, as a reminder, our spiritual gifts class will be right up here in the garden room. If you'd like to join in and discover your spiritual gift and how to use those spiritual gifts, right up there in the garden room. And again, at 1 o'clock online as well. And just as a reminder, normally we gather for night of worship the first Wednesday of every month. But because this month is a holiday, as in Independence Day is on Thursday, we're going to be gathering for night of worship not this Wednesday, but on the 10th. And so if you are new today, thank you for coming today. We're so thankful that you've joined us either online or on campus. If you're on campus, if you would just swing by the Connection Center on your way out, just let them know you're new. They'd love to give you a gift and say thank you for coming. For those of you online, if you'll go ahead and text the word welcome, we'd love to get to know you as well. And then finally, as I mentioned about our prayer teams, our prayer teams love to pray with people. They are so honored when you come forward and ask for prayer. They would love to pray with you this morning. They'll be down here up front. For those of you who are online, we've also, you can chat with your online host there, and you can also send your prayer uh, requests into the, the email that's on the screen there. And so as we conclude our service today, and as we send you out, I want to encourage you, if you're able, would you stand and receive the blessing? So as we think about our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who came, the one who lived a perfect life, the one who gave his life as a sacrifice for us on the cross, the one who reigns and rules in glory today, and the one who invites us into his kingdom to love and to serve in his name. Go in his name and in his grace and in his peace. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.